for another outstanding Muslim mental health conference. Uh, it's an honor to be on this panel, and I'm going to stick out like a sore thumb, but I hope uh, you find this presentation of interest, I hope. Um, so, yeah, so this is uh, a presentation from my research from my book, Jihad Radicalism and the New Atheism. I know it's a dark title. That's because it's a dark book. It's a dark subject. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm grappling with this question that often comes up. Um, how do members of Al-Qaeda Al -Qaeda, or ISIS, Daesh, whatever you want to call them, how do they justify what they do on religious grounds? Now, of course, it'd be naive to think that religion is sort of the only thing motivating people. Of course, there are a lot of factors. But these organizations do present themselves as Islamic. So how do they present, how do they justify this? And then how do most Muslims react to this? Um, and then let me give you the background for the title. Um, this was inspired by, um, do you all remember that Real Time with Bill Maher episode with uh, Sam Harris and Ben Affleck, the actor? Yes. Yes. Right, yeah. So in that episode, Sam Harris, who's a new atheist writer, said that Islam, oh sorry, that, that violent radicals are, are sort of the center of Islam, and that Islam is the mother load of bad ideas. Two weeks later, if I recall correctly, he went on CNN with Fareed Zakaria, and he said that um, Usama bin Laden's interpretation of Islam is straightforward, honest, and you have to do mental acrobatics to make it look non-canonical. Now, I found that the writings of the New Atheists, like Sam Harris, like Ayan Hirsi Ali, like Richard Dawkins, um, tend to be influential in my context, which is public research universities in the Midwest. Um, that's why it's great to have the work of Lydia Mugahed as an, as a, as an antidote. Um, so I wanted to examine this. I wanted to look into this. I wanted to see, okay, so let's, let's examine this, the topic of jihad. Let's examine the topic of violent radicalism. Not radicalism. I, I should have said violent radicalism. And the topic of the new atheism and how they talk about, how they think about jihad. Um, I assume everybody here knows what jihad means. What does jihad mean? Struggle, okay, no one said holy war against infidels. All right, good. Now, um, but of course it can include an armed dimension, right? And in the context of Islamic law, that's how, if you look at medieval and modern legal manuals, that's how it's used. It's referred, used to refer to armed struggle against outsiders. Um, what is the purpose of armed jihad? I'm not going to get into that. I'll just do the easy thing and point you to a book by Sanaa Saladuddin. Uh, she's a professor at Indiana University. And she has this outstanding book called Striving in the Path of God, which was published by Oxford University Press a couple of years ago. It's, it's not a book on Islamic law, but it's looking at commentaries, numerous commentaries in various contexts and showing the different interpretations of jihad, the purpose of armed jihad. Is it strictly defensive? Is it more than that? She, she shows the different perspectives historically. But my focus here will be the rules of warfare, because in the brief time that we have, I'm going to focus on how um, members of ISIS in particular, how they justify acts of terrorism. Um, and this will involve a, a, a discussion or an, an analysis of the rules of warfare. And the rule I'd like to focus on is this one. That non-combatant women and prepubescent children may not be targeted in combat. This is widely accepted across the schools of law, uh, Islamic law. Uh, when you look at even the writings of ISIS and Al-Qaeda, they will say themselves, we know we're not supposed to target non-combatant women and children. However, that's what we'll get into. Um, how about non-combatant men? Well, there are numerous hadiths, reports, where the Prophet, peace be upon him, Prophet Muhammad, is quoted as uh, saying that certain categories of men should not be harmed. Uh, for instance, there's a hadith where he says that even the hired servant who is with the enemy force on the battlefield is not to be harmed. Uh, these are of varying levels of authenticity, so they are debated. Um, I should point out that there is a minority opinion, the Shafi'i opinion, uh, which says that any enemy man is a legitimate target. But that is a minority opinion, and it, go, it, run, 
runs counter to the sayings, the various hadiths that we have. Okay, and I, I mentioned that just to highlight, just to draw attention to the fact that there's really no debate about the first point, about not combating women and children. And that's going to, uh, you'll see why I'm, I'm stressing this. So now let's think about ISIS. Uh, I mentioned that Sam Harris, the New Atheist writer, says that Bin Laden's interpretation of Islam is honest and straightforward. He says similar things about ISIS in his writings and in his, you know, his blogs and so on. So let's, let's think about this. Are they literalists and are they honest? From a, just looking at it from an Islamic, um, no, looking at the, the way they, they describe um, their, how they justify terrorism, excuse me. So, for the brief time that we have, I'm going to focus on um, the January 2017 issue of the ISIS online magazine, Rumiya, which is extremely disturbing. So, this was a really disturbing book, I have to say, because imagine it's like 2 in the morning, my wife and kids are sleeping upstairs, and I'm looking through all this stuff. It was really disturbing. I'm looking at uh, Sam Harris and I understand. It was just a lot of fun. I'm being sarcastic. So this is a very gruesome publication. I mean, I've seen R-rated movies, many of them. This was worse than those movies because they're showing you real images and they are really disturbing. And I, by the way, in case you're wondering, I, I, I access this by going to an academic website or else I wouldn't be here today. So anyway, so, uh, so um, Looking at the January 2017 issue, they have this article which is featured here, Collateral Carnage. And that's of course blood everywhere, right? Um, and in this article, we see a justification for terrorism against its enemies, against the enemies of ISIS. So this is supposed to be an Islamic justification. They say that the Prophet Muhammad used catapults at Ta'if. So what they're saying is, and I want to stress, this is how they're presenting it. So I hope no one leaves until I get to the other part where I talk about the response. But what they say is, look at this. The Prophet is using a weapon of mass destruction. He's launching it, and the impression one gets is over the walls of, that was, so I should give you the background. The people of Ta'if, uh, the people of Taqif, they were in a fortress. And there was, they were engaged in combat with the Muslim forces. And so what they're saying here in this ISIS magazine is that the Prophet used catapults and the impression one gets is they're launching it over the walls to attack whoever's there. Whoever's there will you know, help women and children who are killed. Um, and then they, they point to another, uh, they, and actually I should, I should clarify the thing about Ta'if that's not in the major hadith collections, like Bukhari and Muslim. This comes from the biographies of the Prophet, the Sira. The other justification, they point to a hadith that's in Sahih and Bukhari, Sahih and Muslim. These are major Sunni hadith collections. And in this hadith, one of the Prophet's companions asked him whether it would be permissible to attack an enemy force at night, as such an attack could lead to collateral casualties. The Prophet indicated that this would be permissible. Okay. And they go on to say, notice the Hadith just said it's permissible, but the author, who we don't know, is an anonymous author, the author goes on to say that it's, the, it's better to attack at night. The author says the best practice when conducting raids is to start during the night or at the break of dawn, before the sun rises, while the enemy is asleep, and no light shines, and an adult male is not easily distinguishable from women and children. And how do they justify this? Remarkably, by conflating the divine with the human. They point to a passage in the Quran which says that God punished certain wicked people while they were sleeping. Surah 7, verse 4. And so they say, well, if that's what God does, we, we should follow the example of God. What about the example of Muhammad? We'll get to that later. Now, in conclusion, the author says, one should, and by the way, there is speculation that the author, again, it's anonymous, but there is speculation that the author is a white convert from Texas. Just like why I. Um, in conclusion, the author says, one should not avoid targeting gatherings of the kuffar, unbelievers, whether military or civilian, in which kafir, unbelieving, 
women and children outnumber the kafir unbelieving men. And the author goes on to advocate the use of missiles and explosives. So if one doesn't know any better, one would think, okay, this is a pretty compelling case. They cited evidence. Uh, this is Islamic. This is very Islamic. Okay. Now, obviously, Muslim jurists have come out very strongly against ISIS. Um, here are some Sunni, I'm mostly Sunni examples because ISIS is a Sunni organization, so I'm showing you mostly Sunni examples. Um, and I'm not going to go through these. I think we're familiar with all this. Now, how then do more sort of mainstream Muslim scholars look at what we just saw? So let's revisit the Collateral Carnage article. First, before we even get into the rules of war and so on, this article and ISIS, is, of course, is assuming that there's a state of war between ISIS and various nations, and from the perspective of the majority, ISIS is not a legitimate state to begin with, so that's already an issue. But let's then look at the rules of war. The author, as we saw, presented all enemy men as legitimate targets. And this, as I mentioned, runs counter to various statements attributed to the Prophet. Interestingly, it also runs counter to other issues of Rumiya. In the May 2017, so just five months later, in the May 2017 issue, we had an article where they described certain categories of men that should not be harmed. Um, so there's a lot of internal inconsistency already. Um, and it's interesting because with Bin Laden, I have to do some digging to find sloppiness. ISIS was pretty easy. ISIS, you can see it right there. Um, so, and I think it's important to kind of take a step back and think about these organizations, you know, the way, the way that they're presented and conceived. You know, we, people will say, oh, you know, the Bakr al-Baghdadi, he has a PhD in Islamic studies. So he knows what he's talking about. Do you know where he got his PhD from? Anyone know? A university established by Saddam Hussein in 1989. Not like Al Azhar or University of Medina or whatever. And you know what his PhD was on? It was not Islamic law, it was on Tajweed. What's Tajweed? How you recite the Quran. He's looking at an old text that describes the rules of how you recite, how you pronounce the letters of the Quran. His master's was on the same thing. And as an undergrad, he began Islamic law, but then he apparently was frustrated. Um, bin Laden, you see something, Bin Laden is a business school dropout, okay, which you have no evidence that he graduated, contrary to what you see on the Wikipedia page. And um, when you look at Bin Laden, I mean, you see again a lot of, you know, he, people assume that he knows what he's talking about because he's making reference to things that people don't know. For instance, after, and I'm kind of digressing, but I'll come back. Um, after 9-11, He's, he's, he does this interview, and he said, I think it's with Jazeera, actually, if I recall correctly. And he says that in our religion, you're not supposed to kill all women and children, but if the enemy kills our women and children, we can kill their women and children. And this is the view of four great medieval scholars. Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyyah, uh, al Qurtubi, and al Shawkani. And I remember reading that thinking, huh, I don't remember those scholars saying that. So I went back and looked at what they have to say. They don't say that. And what's interesting is that Qurtubi, one of the four scholars Bin Laden mentioned, explicitly says the opposite in his commentary on Surah 5, verse 8. In his commentary he says, if the enemy kills our women and children, this is how they speak, I'm just quoting, then we cannot kill their women and children, even if that causes us great anger. So he explicitly says the opposite. Anyway, back to this. Okay. The author of the ISIS article also presents all other civilians who may be harmed as collateral casualties. And this, of course, is the whole point of the article, is to justify collateral casualties. And the first justification, as we saw, is that the Prophet used catapults at five. And remember, this comes from the seerah, the biographies of the Prophet. So I went back and looked at the biogra biographical accounts. And what I found was that in Ibn Hisham, in this hop, or Ibn Hisham in particular, here's a biography which just says that he used catapults, and they leave it at that. But when you look at the other accounts, the more detailed accounts, we get an interesting narrative. And I'm thinking here of Al-Waqidi. 
in his account. In that account, the Muslim forces are engaged in combat with the people at Ta'if, Ben Al-Faqif. And at one, at one point, you see you have these people uh, you know, standing uh, on top of a wall, attacking at the Muslims. And one of the rules of warfare is you never want to be below somebody. Um, and so the Prophet wants to think of wants a, a suggestion. So man the Pharisee, who often conveniently pops up to offer military advice, <laughs> says, I have an idea that where I'm from, we use uh, a manjaniq, uh, uh, the manganos, uh, which is a kind of catapult. We use it to breach the walls. So we use it to break down the walls. Um, so why don't we do that? The prophet says, okay, let's try that. So they prepare a very simple catapult. And the idea is that they're going to launch it at the wall, which is guarded by soldiers. They're not even able to launch it. Ben Thaqif shoots scraps of hot iron at them and arrows. Twelve Muslims die, and they're not even able to use it to begin with. That is what ISIS used as a justification. Um, with, so the idea here is that in the biographies, the Prophet attempted to use a manual once in a failed attempt to breach a wall guarded by combatants. This is very different from how it's presented in the ISIS magazine. And by the way, remember that the ISIS author says we should use missiles and rockets and so on. Um, it's important to point out that even for those scholars who, you know, who talk about the legitimate use of mangonels, and many do, uh, they make a distinction between stones and fire. Um, and reading the ISIS magazine, one would have no sense that there was, there was people are sleeping and there's no light. And remember, this is the example of God. But what about the example of Muhammad, about the Prophet, peace be upon him? Well, interestingly, there's a widely known hadith that the author of the ISIS piece seems not to be aware of. Uh, doesn't make reference to it, doesn't seem to be aware of it. But there's a widely known hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, which says that whenever the Prophet reached the people by night, he never started an attack until it was morning. You never have a report of Muhammad the Prophet involved in an attack in pitch dark. Um, and then the author went on to advocate the use of missiles and explosives. And here we could say that from the majority perspective, ISIS killings of non-combatants are far more intentional than what is permitted in early Islamic sources, and the claim that such killings are collateral is disingenuous. So, with this in mind, some closing thoughts. First, like many other Muslims, the leadership of ISIS uses early Islamic texts to justify their actions. Remember, they're saying we are the Islamic State. But the justifications all put forward by ISIS for terrorism require the abandonment of both strict literalism and the prevailing interpretations of Islam, past and present. And so, I would suggest that they are not literalists, and, uh, I mean, are they honest? Maybe in, in their minds, in some of their minds they are, but it would be dishonest to say that this is representative of the Islamic tradition. So with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. Hamdani is a Pakistan-born American who became a commentator after her son was actually killed during Al-Qaeda's attacks on September 11, 2001. Um, she was a school teacher in Pakistan before immigrating to the U.S. She continued to be a school teacher here, and now she's an activist and a public speaker on civil liberties and human rights. So this is a great topic to have right now. Welcome. Assalamu alaikum and thank you everybody for being here. <clears throat> I would like to thank Dr. Farah Basi and nice to meet Dr. Khali again. And uh, <coughs> everyone who's here present over here. It's a very 
I also had a conference and I am really honored to be part of it. You know, whatever the reason may be that has brought me into this discussion, this conference. And <clears throat> that's Salman. We'll come back to him. So, uh, after listening to Dr. Lee's presentation and the discussion on Dr. Khalil, I would like to introduce myself as a victim of terrorism. You know, American Muslim victim of terrorism, and I would like to talk about it, you know, like a brief, briefly, very briefly, my take on it, on terrorism. Now, the definition of terrorism as given by the NATO is the unlawful use or threatened use of force or evidence against individuals or property in an attempt to coerce or intimidate governments or societies to achieve political, religious or ideological objectives. And if you look at the definition of terrorism, all the dictionaries, they define terrorism as such. Now the America that we live in, the land of immigrants, the land of Emma Lazarus, who posted that poem, Mother of Exiles, with a torch raised in her hand. Give me your tired, your poor, huddled masses, yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your, of teeming, of your teeming shores, send those, the homeless tempest tossed to me. That was the America we came to understand. That's the America we lived in pre-9-11. And that's what the fight is now, about the civil liberties, about the liberties of everybody at that stake right now. It's not about Muslims or Christians or Jews or Hindus. It's about everybody. And she says, I left my lamp, lift my lamp beside the golden door. This was in 1883. So the America we live in now has lost her values of liberty, justice, religious freedom, and has really disintegrated into a nation of hate, discrimination, xenophobia, bigotry, and is ruled by a very dangerous ideology of nationalism. It's not the right ideology of nationalism. It is a very dangerous ideology of nationalism, which is eroding us from within. Like someone said, I forgot the name, that when, if America disintegrates, we will disintegrate from within. So that's the danger out there, the, the philosophy of nationalism. Our civil liberties are at stake which have come under attack for security reasons. They say, oh, for our security, we have to implement this law and this rule and take away, you know, the NDAA and the Patriot Act, under which it is still active. They, are, they, are both, they both exist. Our liberties are taken away. But what's the sense of having a liberty if you cease to exist? That's my question. And I had this discussion with uh, the Vice President, you know, let, let, and he was a senator at that time, our previous vice president. So the pilgrims escaped British for religious reasons, to escape religious torture, extremism, and came to this country. And what have we become? You know, Guantanamo is our shame. It is America's shame. 17 years now we are torturing those people. No representation, no discussion. This is not what America was. We have to take our nation back. The white supremacist philosophy has to be replaced. And now I will talk about Salman. It's tough as it is to talk about him. Every time I say I will not do it again when the time comes near. But then, this is my jihad, Dr. Khalid. This is my jihad to get justice for my son. If the 
Kumar was born on December 28, 77 at um, 7th and Regis Hospital in Karachi. And three years later, I found his birth certificate. And the time of birth was 1.19 a.m. 1.19 a.m. You reverse that. It's 9.11. Many years later, 9-11 happened. <clears throat> and he came to America. He was 13 months old. I brought him with me. And we lived in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. And he was a very compassionate, very helpful young man, young boy. Uh, growing up in the streets of Brooklyn, he was bullied. And I had sent him, you know, since I always went to a parochial school back home in Pakistan, I had sent him to, you know, St. Cecilia School for discipline, you know, and I told the principal he will not uh, attend the church because he's a Muslim. So he sat outside her office. When the class went to uh, the church, he sat outside the principal's office and ran her errands. And then <laughs> and one day he comes home and he says, Mama, I don't want to go to school anymore. And I said, why? Well, because I keep saying you're not Catholic. You don't belong here. I said, okay. So I went to the principal system area and I explained to her this is what happened. And she said, don't worry, Ms. Sandani, I'll take care of it. And a couple of days later, Salman comes home. That's his fourth grade picture. And that's so significant, be the people constitution. And he, he, he said, uh, I've given the Quran, I have to bring it to school. I said, why? Well, because I'm a social studies teacher, I told everybody to bring their book of faith. So I gave him the Quran and he took it to school and he came back. So, and after that, they stopped bullying him in school for, being not, for not being a Catholic. And that's what this nation needs, diversity. Training in diversity, different faiths, education in the fourth grade. Growing up on the streets of Brooklyn, he was bullied also physically. So then his father sent him to a karate school for self-defense. And that he, he always told me, Mama, I have to tell the other person, I know karate. Don't mess with me. And there, were, and there were two instances in his life he had to use it. Once when he was, I think, like 14 years old and a kid two years older than him and a friend's son, you know, challenged him and said, okay, take it outside. I said, okay, take it outside. And I followed them and he said, you know, I can tell you, I know karate. Don't mess with me. And the other guy, kid said, ah, now nah, come on, let's go. So, the other guy is standing like this, and he twists, flips around on his left leg, and he kicks him in his stomach with his right leg. And the, the other guy, you know, he just went down and he never bothered him after that. So, you know, he was very fair. He did tell him in front of me. <laughs> and the other incident that he used it was when he was, uh, I think, like, 19, 18, 18 years old. He was a coach at the YMCA and he taught the basketball and you know, played baseball. And there was a group of kids, Arab, you know, Yemeni, Hindu, Sikh, Muslim, Christian, you know, there was no Jew in that neighborhood in Greenpoint program. So it was a very mixed, you know, he was raised like a normal <coughs> person. and. Uh, they always used to lose, his team would always lose, so one day they won. And then my second son, the one on the, over there, Adnan, he was I think like, uh, if Salman was 17, he was 14, third, 14 or he was 4 years younger, 13. So he goes to the other team, you know, you know like, nah, 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 you know. And they got upset, they were a grand group of hoodlums, and they, came at Radna. So Salman said, don't pick on him, pick on me, find an adult. So as long as they were doing one on one, he was fine, but then they cordoned him, you know, and they beat him up real bad. And he came to the store, we had a store in Twin Point, Brooklyn, and all beaten up and everything, and my husband said, we're going to go and find those guys in the park. And I said, you know, Salman, if you want to do something, do it legally. Do not take law in your hands, number one. Secondly, those people who beat you up, they were homeless people. They don't have anything to lose. You have a life. You become a police officer and then you can help them out. 
you know. So I think that was one of the reasons why he veered towards becoming a cadet. And he joined the uh, <coughs> NYPD cadet from Queen's College for a stipend of $1,000 a month, I think they gave him. They still recruit them. The NYPD still recruit them from Queen's College. He was a very avid Star Wars fan. He used to read so much, unbelievable. 500 pages he would read in two days. Michael Jordan and some other authors, you know. <clears throat> but he was a Star Wars fan. And one day I asked him, you know, uh, Samar, what is Star Wars? And he goes, oh, mama. He jumped back. You don't know what Star Wars is? You are not an American then. <laughs> so that's how important the Star Wars saga was for him. And, and it's true. It is true. It is an American saga. It, it is an American saga and it and I think he he imagined himself as one of the Jedi's because his license plate that year he got it in March of 2001 was read Why you and G young Jedi. That was his license plate, you know. He was very patriotic, loving, compassionate, he would help, you know, people on the streets, if the car is stopped, they would he push them aside or if someone is injured, he would you know, pull up and help them out. He was a first responder, 75. And very patriotic. He would bring home, you know, animals and then nurse them. One day, <coughs> brought him a bird and, and went to school and we applied to America. Hardly on it, you know. The wing was broken. So. And the bird died and threw the bird out. So when he came back from school, oh, where's the bird? I said, the bird died. The bird said, where is he? I said, I threw it in the garbage. Oh my God, he was so upset. He went out, brought the bird back. He said, don't you ever do that again. And then he went into the backyard and buried the bird. You know, life, like I say, we can set, feel, we can see the pain of other people and animals, but he could feel it. His soul was different. He could feel their pain. <coughs> and then being a patriotism, I said, he wanted to become a medical doctor. And I said, why don't you go to, you know, Pakistan or to the Caribbean? And he goes, no, if I become a medical doctor, it will be on American soil. And the year that it happened, he was in his first year of MD-PhD program uh, out of Cornell for Harvard U.S. Medical Institute. So he graduated <coughs> on June 6th that year. He was 23 years old. Uh, he was the big brother of my younger two sons, Bhaijan. He was our moral strength. If you could find, if you can ask someone, if you could tell who is the strength of your family, the rock of your family, it was Salman. And to this day, if there is a tough moment in my life, or my other two boys' life, we still reflect, what would Bhajan have said? What would he have done today? So that day was a, September 11, 2001, was a Tuesday. Uh, it was a crispy, clear day, and I went to school at 7.15, dropped my two boys. No, dropped my younger son, the Adnan was at Binghamton. And Salman used to take the bus, and I was in the classroom when it happened. So when I came out, 10.20? Yeah, 10.20 20 I came out, and I saw teachers huddled in the hallway. I walked up, and I heard them talking that the Twin Towers is for has been attacked, if one has fallen, and said, no, this must be wrong. So I called my husband. And there he was, and the first thing he said, my Salman is there. And I said, Salman doesn't work there. He works on 65th and 1st Avenue. That is downtown. And then he says, oh, the second tower is coming down. And he was crying, and I was crying, and I remember wiping my tears and saying, I don't know anyone there. Why am I crying? But then later I discovered that that is the tower where his remains were discovered in 34 pieces. And the moment his life was extinguished, the three of us were together. Talking about countering violent extremism, it exists in not the Muslim community only, it exists everywhere. That's why my question is, how come we don't focus on the non-Muslims, you know, other <coughs> communities that, you know, 
act, do act, commit act of violence. <clears throat> Coming back to my story, um, he didn't come home. We searched for him for 10 days. We went down to the Twin Tower area. Uh, we were not allowed to go within one mile of it. It was very bad, you know. Ammonia in the air and sulfur was, you know, cutting our lungs. And um, then a month later, we decided to go to Mecca to find some answers. And the day we are leaving, you know, um, a journalist came to our house. In New York Post, one came first, then, then the Times came, and uh, New York Daily News, and there was another one, Newsday. And then I said, why are you, uh, what brings you back to my house again after a whole month? And I was in the, you know, I was supposed to leave in an hour or so for the airport. And then they told us that there is a flyer circulating um, uh, the MTA looking for your son. And that's why we are here. And I said, okay. And then I left and I told the New York Post guy, uh, he has some question about Adnan that he's the uh, president of uh, Binghamton MSA. So I said, oh, so you've done your homework very well. You know, they sent my antenna up. And anyways, I left that day, and next day the papers came out, the news came out that the family has gone to pray. But New York Post was, uh, headline was, missing or hiding. Yes, that's New York Post, that's Fox Channel, that's our Peter King. Missing or hiding. And it said in the uh, article that, um, People say he was seen at 11.30 a.m. at the... <coughs> so he, you know, and people were surprised that they're living next to... A, a terrorist was living next to them. So my son was a terrorist for this country. And they tried their best to link him, to link him to these attacks. So we came back from Mecca and, you know, the congressman, Ackerman interrogated and, of course, there was nothing to find. And, but they, they tried, when I say they, I mean, you know, it was the NYPD that betrayed him. <coughs> the NYPD betrayed him because the flyer that was circulating was his flyer from the NYPD with his picture, with his bio data, and it said, Wanted by terrorist task force, hold and detain, chemistry major has, has, yeah, has police, has the NYPD ID. So it wasn't a nice flyer, a mom looking for, you know, son had her. No, it was a very biased and, you know. And then six months later, on March 20th, you know, they confirmed that his remains were found um, by the North Tower, which was hit first and collapsed second. And I did ask the medical examiner, uh, why did it take so long? When did you find the remains? He said the week of October 23rd and 20. Six, those three days. And those three days we were in Mecca. So I didn't get the answer. So I said, why took, what, why took you so long? Five months. Then he gave me, you know, a nonsensical story. Oh, we had to match each part with each other, with your DNA, with the husband's DNA. No. They wanted to find something to pin on him as a terrorist. And they could not. So we had his funeral on the... Uh, May, um, April 5th, 2002, so six months later. But then there was no media out there anymore. But this was not sensational news for them anymore. You know, there's the Muslim who is now being acclaimed as a hero. So, so our media, of course, we all know is biased. And uh, coming back to the topic of this. Uh, psychiatric conference. Um, in, so after 9-11 we were able to, like in 2003, we were able to come back a little bit, move forward in life, so to say. Uh, Adnan got married and then his father became sick and in July 2004 he died. He was uh, like, you know, he, he gave up his, you know, desire to live the day it happened. Because he knew Salman was there. I did not, but he knew. So he died and that created a vacuum in the house. 
big brother gone, and then the father dies. And so we all three of us, I have two more boys, I just saw in the picture, the Nan and Sisha. So we all stopped functioning. Literally, we just lived, we ate and slept, and ate and slept. But we didn't, we stopped functioning. Uh, I couldn't teach anymore. Zishan couldn't study anymore because when it happened, he was in the classroom. Adnan was in his uh, third year of medical. When his father died, he said, I don't want to be a doctor anymore. I cannot tell a patient he's going to be fine, so I said, take time off. So from 2004 to 7, we were existing. That's all I can say, existing at home. And, but one thing I did, I sold the house from Queens and we moved to Long Island, you know. I wanted to get out of New York, but the boys were born and raised there, so they didn't want to leave. So we started, and since <laughs> then in 2008, we started, you know, coming back to life. I started teaching again. Dishan went back to school. Uh, Adnan wanted to uh, not become a physician, so I said, well, go get a job. Uh, you'll have an MS under your belt, you know, we will see. And so he came back after a week, he said, I gave us so many interviews and I have to start from the bottom, Mama. I said, oh, so you think they're going to make you the CEO of the company? <laughs> so he goes, I think I'll go back to medical school. I said, do it. And he went back. And he went back. And he graduated, you know, and he's, thank God, Alhamdulillah, God is so great. He is now an attendee in emergency medicine at Stony Brook Hospital. And I lived there, and he came home after 14 years, and he lives with me. I, I can't be happier now when he has a three-year-old son. So, life is good. You know, I told you my whole story. But the gist of this, you know, uh, one other thing, 9-11 memorial uh, has not um, placed his name with the other uh, members of the NYPD with other first responders. And they have not, the NYPD in the city of New York has not acknowledged him officially, you know. Although Bloomer said at his funeral, uh, thank you Mrs. Hamdani for giving us your son. He walked towards the towers, the burning towers, and others were walking away. But what did the city of New York do? They denied him. So they denied him his legitimate place in history by not officially recognizing him as a cadet of the NYPD and that is my jihad still going on. I'm still fighting for that. And so Salman coming in, this is conclusion. Uh, he gave me the intense joys of motherhood but also the pains and sorrow of eternal sorrow of losing him and as I said there's a scholarship established for him and the street that we lived on I got it dedicated in his name. Um, most importantly in post 9-11 I not only lost my son Salman but at that time I lost my country because they said you're an immigrant you don't belong here and I lost my identity and the only thing that I was left was uh, of being a Muslim. And Islam and terrorism are synonymous in the minds of many people. Unfortunately, they are, you know, we are, it is a fact, and we are living it is in, in the dark ages again. It's not the dark ages of the biblical time, but dark ages right now of, of in America. And then, so, Islam, as you all know, means peace. And killing of one person means killing all of humanity, and saving one person means saving all of humanity. So, I am very proud, I am very proud to be known as the mother of Salman Hamdani. You know, kids are known by their parents' name, but I am fortunate that I am known by the deeds of my son. Salman transcended the barriers of race, 
when he, was, when he responded to the attacks, he, respond, he transcended the barriers of race, faith, and ethnicity. And to keep his legacy alive, that's what we need to do also. You know, you need to redeem America. We need to redeem America back to what we were. You know, that's his legacy. And he is my strength and I am his voice. You become the strength of this nation and become the voice of this nation and go redeem our country back again. Thank you.